What's up, you beautiful people out there? I hope you're having an absolutely incredible day so far. And if you're not already having an incredible day, we'll make it better for you because we are going to enlighten you. Uh, and we're not going to enlighten you just when it comes to lending today. We're going to talk about an important factor which helps us understand how much money we can lend you. And that is appraisals, actually. So uh, I got a good friend coming on the show today. His name's Adam Lawrence, and he's a guy I've known for about five years. And uh, one of my favorite people in the appraisal space, guys, honest, tells it how it is, works hard. And that's what we care about around here, which is uh, all sorts of fun. Um, Adam has a firm in uh, Kelowna or an office in Kelowna, as well as in Vancouver services all over the Lower Mainland and the Okanagan. His firm is called Ad Law Appraisals. And this guy basically grew up on appraisals. His dad was an appraiser. He started appraising really young and then he started his own firm. So if any, there's any guy you want to talk to about appraisals, this is Adam. It's going to be an interesting show. Uh, listen, this is important to you if you're someone who's purchasing a home, if you're someone who's buying in this market right now, especially a hot market, trying to understand what does it mean if your appraisal comes in at value or it doesn't. Um, if you're trying to predict different locations and areas and understand what actually goes into the report, all really important stuff. Listen, if you're in the industry, if you're outside the industry, I think this one is really going to open your eyes as to understanding the values of a property. Now, today, as always, we try to give away um, a Thrive mug uh, to every single one of our beautiful reviewers. So today, my ask to you guys, if you are listening to this show, watching on YouTube or wherever, do us a solid. If you're getting value out of the show, send us a DM. Leave us a rating on iTunes. That means everything. Share our show. That is what I ask of you today. That is the only thing I'm going to ask for forever. Other than that, let us know if you're liking the show. Enjoy this episode with Adam Lawrenson, Mad Law Appraisals. See you on the other side. What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. Welcome to the show, my man. We're very happy to have you on. It's a long time coming. We know, uh, hey, we've done this. We're sort of things like this a long time ago in the past, a little bit live. We're going to make this formal now, which I'm so excited to ha have and uh, put you on the, the big screen, put you on the podcast. It's going to be permanent, which is uh, super fun. Um, Adam, I know you're pumped to join the show here. We, we joke around, say, Ella Presidente, you are, in fact, the owner of AdLaw Appraisals, uh, and you take care of appraisals for all over the Lower Mainland and Okanagan as well. You got it, man. Yeah, we got about 10 appraisers covering Chilliwack to Whistler and uh, Okanagan, Vernon, Kelowna, Penticton. Really pumped to have you here, and um, I we were just talking before the uh, before you came on uh, to Derek and and to Dean here, who are joining me um, on the screen. And you know, we were just excited to kind of break down not only the appraisal process, but quite honestly, the the things that just keep coming up over and over and over and over. And it's like when we have you on, you can help us help us break this all down, right? I can try. <laughs> I can try. Awesome, Derek, lead us off, buddy. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is going to be a good one because, you know, like the clients, the borrowers, real estate agents, even for the most part, they don't see the appraisals. So I think it's kind of an underestimated part of the purchasing process or refinancing process. So it'll be good to dig into this and, and definitely, uh, you know, spread your wings and fill us in. Um, so obviously everything's always changing, right? Um, COVID's a big part of that. Businesses are changing. Industries are changing. Um, we've seen some changes from our side. Some banks are, you know, supporting some more technology savvy uh, valuation models, which you obviously are, are aware of. So I wanted to get your thoughts um, on how appraisals and regulation has changed over the last couple of years and where you kind of see things going. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thanks, guys. And Alex, Dean, Derek, so happy to be here. Um, I've been following Alex since I got into the appraisal business in 2008. 13 and just seeing what he's done over the last couple of years and you guys are an awesome team so i'm just so happy to be here thanks for having me um so the appraisal industry yeah it's funny i haven't been asked this question in a while like you know where does it come from where is it at now where is it going and it's funny i was thinking about it and my grandfather i i saw my grandfather's appraisal today i went through all my uh all my stacks of stuff and he did an appraisal in the 1960s with pen and and pencil 
and you didn't need any accreditation to do an appraisal in the 60s. Anyone could do an appraisal. As long as you said you were an appraiser, you had a pen and paper, you could do an appraisal. So wow. it's, the exact, it's the exact same thing um, you know, today is that you're looking, the fundamentals are the subject property, describe it as best you can. What are all the key value drivers of that property? And then you're comparing it to the market, what's happening in the market, and you, uh, you use your appraiser judgment and, uh, and some analysis to come up with that final appraised value. Um, so that was the 60s. Uh, the 90s was completely different. My father started an appraisal company in the 1990s, and it was pretty old school as well. They had everything in a big book. They were photocopying left, right, and center, uh, going down to pick up pictures at the photo mat, um, you know, printing it out, delivering it to the bank. So, you know, super old school. I mean, imagine me delivering an appraisal to you guys today. It's, uh, it sounds completely insane. Um, and today we have the power of technology to really do things faster and effective um, more so than any other time. And it, it's amazing. So we can really up our efficiency. And um, some of the, the hiccups that come into play are just the data, making sure we have the best data possible. Uh, the MLS listing is, uh, is a great, great resource for us to uh, make sure we have the, the best and most supportable value possible. And uh, I think you're asking one more question about um, AVMs. Yeah. Kind of like the technology that's coming along. So AVMs are automated valuation models. They've been around since the late 80s, early 90s. And it was a way to basically get deals done faster. So especially in low risk situations, the bank says, okay, we can hire an appraiser. It's going to cost $200. It's going to take you know, a week or 10 days to complete that appraisal. Why don't we put together some, some data we have in the area and kind of spit out a base value that will help us get the deal done. And that's what an AVM is. And they're getting better and better every year. Um, in the early 90s when they were coming on board, it was a it was supposedly a death sentence to appraisers. The whole industry was going to shut down and these computers would take over. Um, that hasn't happened and it's not going to happen. And the reason for that is, I mean, if you I was driving down East Vancouver today on King Edward, uh, every house is different. Every single house is different, whether it's new, old, renovated, uh, good, good layout, bad layout. Um, there's all these key factors that the AVMs can't keep up with and, and real estate like the improvements are changing every five to seven years, uh, massive updates, or it becomes a tenanted property and completely loses value uh, in the sense that you have bad tenants that are just destroying the property. Um, so all these things can happen. And AVMs, you know, they're great for low risk situations, but at the end of the day, if you want 80% loan to value, a lot of times those banks are going to want an appraisal to make sure their loan is well secured. So although it kind of scared us in the early nineties, it hasn't been the, uh, the big downfall to the appraisal industry that we thought it was going to be. So just staying on this topic of change, it's pretty crazy to see where you've come from the 60s to now. Uh, but we've seen a lot of change just because of the pandemic and everything that's going on with COVID. Do you want to maybe just shed some light on some of the significant changes we've seen just since March uh, to now? Yeah, sure. So um, everyone was hit with the big, uh, you know, COVID pandemic in March and, and it was scary. Like the uncertainty was... Um, was really palatable and everyone was feeling it. And what the appraisal industry did was we created something called a modified full appraisal. And we, we communicated that to the banks. And what it was is it's an exterior inspection with time and geo stamped photos provided by the homeowner, occupant, you know, tenant, realtor. And what that does is it create, it gives us enough data to the photos and the exterior inspection to create a, a good solid appraisal report. And um, yeah, that's kind of how we've adjusted to COVID. We, if everyone's comfortable, we go in with masks, gloves. We ask um, the occupants to have all doors and closets open. So we just quickly walk through and, and get out of there as quick as we can, make it nice and quick and safe. Um, but yeah, I mean, what really affected the, the whole entire market and appraisers as well was the drop in sales in April, May. So it was, it was scary. It was kind of the lowest sales volume in 15, 20 years uh, for the month of May. And, you know, like Vancouver normally does, we bounce back super fast. So, you know, people adjusted, people got resourceful and, um, and yeah, and we ended up having October was the busiest uh, real estate month on record for October. So, um, you know, Vancouver and the, and the lower mainland in general is, is quite resourceful and we bounce back pretty quick from these types of things. So a little bit scary in May, but the rest of the year, everything turned out pretty good. So with that being said, I mean, you give us like literally uh, a timeline of appraisals of what happened. Thank God we don't have to uh, 
uh, look at um, sending those appraisals via fax anymore and, and pen and paper. <laughs> I don't, don't think I would have made it in those eras and those times, but uh, we are thankfully in a better space from a technology standpoint. So just, I want to jump back on that technology piece because I'm not sure a lot of people fully understood. So AVM technology auto automated valuation models are essentially a way, again, like you mentioned, uh, for a bank or a lender to avoid, obviously, the, the and it's not avoid appraisers, but avoid the process of obviously having to physically have someone go to the property, which changes the situation. And, and of course, as they're getting better, and we face this in our industry as well with technology, but I think there's a place for it like anything else. Low uh, loan to value, meaning a very low risk situation or a high down payment. On that point, typically we see a lot of people, especially in hot markets or, or expensive markets, such as the Vancouver region, and most of the big cities, you know, they don't own as much of their property as, you know, other areas, but they have a lot of equity because the values are so high. So that alone to me says that physical appraisals are going to be strong for a long time. So you did bring, I'm, I'm getting to a point here, I promise you, but you did bring up a point about the market hitting an absolute low last April and hitting a, a massive uh, point up in, in October. I guess my question kind of alludes to where we're at today. We looked at 2016 and we saw, you referenced West Vancouver, we could see week over week or month over month property values going up by $200,000. I witnessed that today for the first time in a long time in Langley where a property was sold for nearly $200,000 to compared to a, again, a relatively comparable property, relatively the closest comp uh, in the area back in early November. Again, this is two months later. And we're having to now support a value of 1.2 million instead of 1 million in a situation where we haven't seen any other registered sales. How do you even start to approach that as an appraiser? Like, where do you even begin? Yeah, great question, uh, Alex. So, we, yeah, like you said, we, we saw this in 2016 and we're seeing it again today in some areas. And you know, it's a result of, you know, pent up demand, low interest rates. With COVID, people want to live in their, their dream space. They want the bedrooms, they want the right bathrooms, they want the right location, whether it's close to their parents, kids and whatnot. So we're seeing a lot of action and uh, prices skyrocket as a result. So how we do that is we, um, we have to have appraisers that know the individual markets. So if you have an appraiser that's coming from Vancouver to do an appraisal in Langley, doesn't understand the dynamics, the supply demand dynamics, they won't know the market's going like this. Um, and because the the sales don't transfer till about two to three weeks after sometimes, um, appraisers are often two to three weeks behind the eight ball when it comes to true market values. Um, so yeah, we have to use some uh, judgment. We have to know the area, know the supply demand dynamics, and you know and know that those properties are going above asking and take that into consideration when we're doing our appraisal. So although, although say we use three sales, uh, three sales comparables, and they might support a value of 1.1, but the property sold for 1.2, well, we can do a couple of things. We can time adjust those sales. So if those sales happened three or four weeks ago, we can actually time adjust those 100 grand to get up to that sale price and uh, ensure that there's no issues with the uh, financing. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. So we can do what's called an, uh, an appraisal update. An appraisal update means we use the same appraisal, same inspection that we did, but we just use new comparables and a new market analysis. And I'm happy to do that. Even there's some times when, um, yeah, I've done it a handful of times this year. We get the appraisal done in January. Um, say it was a pre-sale. So this, uh, the property sold in 2017 at the peak or 2017, 18 at the peak. They're getting appraisal done now and it's coming in light. Well, I'll put a note, Pat, I'll put a note on my calendar to review that appraisal in one month, see if there's any new sales and let the broker know, hey, uh, a new sale popped up. We can actually support get an extra 50, an extra 100 grand. Uh, they're happy. And as long as the lender will approve an appraisal update, which they usually will, um, then yeah, then that, that works every time. So I'm going to play counter to that point. Have you ever seen it work in an opposite direction? Has it ever happened in the opposite way where a property value has decreased around that or is that something where okay that appraisal report has been complete it's locked in there's no change has that ever happened to you so um no i don't believe an appraisal report is ever in stone an appraisal report is an opinion of value 
based on you know the information that we have available to us at that time i'm always open to reviewing an appraisal to see if we have the data correct for the subject property the floor area the bedroom count etc and to make sure the comparables are the best comparables and yeah always willing to have another another look at a property for sure interesting Interesting. All right. All right. So we uh, recently, again, I don't want to date the episode too much, but let's just say every single year in January, we have this lovely thing hit our hit our door and it's called an assessment. It's a BC assessment. So if you're listening, if you're in British Columbia or you own properties in British Columbia, you probably know what we're talking about. If you're in different provinces, it could be a little bit different. So keep that in mind. Um, we get this assessment every single year and every single year, Dean and Derek and I and the entire team, and I'm sure a lot of other people in the in the uh, mortgage space get a whack load of emails, phone calls, text messages and questions saying, hey, I just got this report. What does it mean? Am I paying more tax? Am I paying um, like is my home worth more? Is my home worth less? Like, oh, my gosh, I just bought it. And it just stresses people out like crazy, like nothing I've ever seen. And in fact, that continues pretty much all year until the end of the year as people look up their assessment values and compare it what is a bc assessment adam and how do they get those numbers please help us alex we've been talking about bc assessments for how many years now <laughs> every year five six seven eight years um, <laughs> every year. yeah so like you said january assessments come what do they mean why is it important so i worked with the assessment authority for two years and the goal of the assessment authority is to fairly distribute the tax base amongst the citizens of that area um, so they do their best. They, they use mass assessment tools. So they're not coming into the property. They're using algorithms and they're spreading a couple points of data across the entire area. And of course, when you do that, you get uh, some properties that are bang on with market value, some that are below market value and some that are way uh, above market value. And they have um, statistics to kind of prove that. So as long as like when I was uh, doing North Burnaby, I had 15,000 properties. As long as the, the uh, statistics were good enough, where the average kind of was close to the sale, if the, if the assessed value was close to the sale price, um, we, would, we, would, we, would, we would check off the, the whole assessment of 15,000 uh, homes and we'd, we'd send those assessments out. So like, and what was that margin of, was there, what was the margin that you could have? Huge margin. So think about a, a graph like just, just like this and you've got, uh, you've got boom, lower, higher, lower, some that are right on and that's the assessment to the sale price ratio. Okay, so what you just described, because most people are listening to a podcast right now, is a, a hor not a horizontal, a diagonal line with different uh, values coming in lower and yeah, higher yeah. Okay, in that I'm range. Gonna, I'm assuming uh, I'm assuming everyone's on video in 2021. Um, yeah, so basically, there's a there's a huge co coefficient of dispersion. Um, usually, it's around seven or eight percent. Um, and so what that means is you have 15,000 properties that you're assessing. Say there's a hundred sales in that area. That of those 100 sales, like the average should be around 97% of the market value. Got it. Course, okay. So the they're... averages, some are high, some are low. But once you get and They're that not average... accounting for your, your, your renovations and they're not accounting for your new basement suite and they're not accounting for, um, you know, the new roof you put on the home or the fact that you're overlooking, a, you know, maybe a, a pond or something of that nature. Are these things considered? Um, I can break it down exactly to how we do an assessment. That could be maybe for another show. No, please don't uh, do that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's pr it's pretty it's pretty basic. But what they do is they take a couple data points, spread it over all the properties, and yeah, like you said, so if a property sells in the area that's got some positive features, that's going to apply to all the houses, even the ones that don't have those positive features. Um, conversely, if a property sells that has some negative influences, they might take that value and and spread it across thousands of properties, many of which don't have that negative influence. And what do you get? You get a hodgepodge of values. Some are high, some are low. Uh, my example is the house that we live in now. We bought it in June of 2017. And when our assessment came out uh, in January 2018, it was 77% of the value. So the assessment mm -hmm. was uh, much lower than, than the market value. And um, so, I mean, what, that doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean we pay less tax because um, you know, uh, a, a rising tide raises all boats. So if the, all the assessments go up 20% or 30%, the government still needs X amount of dollars to operate. And the same goes the other way. If the market, if your market values go down 20 to 30% on your assessment, the government still needs X amount of dollars. And what, what will happen is if all the values go down, the tax rate will go up to balance that out and, uh, and vice versa. So my, my thoughts on the assessment is, is take them with a grain of salt, take them very lightly. Um, if it's low, you know, just think to yourself, you know, I pay a little bit less in tax. If it's higher than the, your neighbors just say, Hey, I got a nice place. I should be proud of that. Um, if you want an exact value of your property as of a certain date, hire a professional. Appraiser. 
Love it. Absolutely. Love it. I think a lot of people stress out about assessments and values when it's not really relevant to their current situation anyways, right? Like if you're not selling or refinancing in that market, it doesn't really matter. So there's zero reason to stress it. Even if you fought tooth and nail, you might save a hundred bucks in taxes or something like that. And, um, you know, we're all busy people. And, um, I think, I think it should just be taken lightly and used as a, uh, as a tool for distributing taxes and, and that's it. Yeah, for sure. So there's another big piece we wanted to touch on, um, which is market rents. So for years and years, we've been battling, you know, you're someone's buying a house with a basement suite and the bank wants a rental agreement, like a physical agreement with someone committing to renting that suite, which is very hard to achieve, obviously, when you don't own the property. So it's been this crazy gray area in lending for a long time. So finally, a lot of banks and credit unions are starting to work with us and they're accepting market rents, which I'll let you dig into, but it's essentially a an economic rents to confirm what a basement suite or what a property could rent out for in the current market state right it's the same as an appraisal with an appraisal we're telling you what the most probable selling price of a property is same with a market rent we're saying what's the most probable rent this uh, basement suite or this townhouse is going to achieve in the market it's not always exactly what it's it could be currently renting for a thousand dollars but just like an appraisal we have to scour the market and find evidence to support that that thousand dollars is reasonable sometimes it's low if it's been um you know if they've had a tenant there for a number of years and sometimes it's high most often it's high because they're including internet tv phone um you know whatever else and um from a financing perspective the banks don't want to include that type of rent they want a pure market rent what would this property rent for without furniture without utilities for 12 months um yeah so where are you doing that research? Like, where are you finding comparables? Good question. So, um, and market rents have changed a lot. So about five years ago, you could just come up with a market rent out of thin air. And it would be a one liner in a report. It would say the market rent for this house is $10,000 a month. And nobody asked any questions. And I guess um, after enough appraisers got sued for just putting ridiculous values out there, now we have to support it. Um, sources that we use are Craigslist, Kijiji, uh, Facebook Marketplace is a great one. And most appraisal firms like of our size and comparable firms have a database. So whenever we're in a property for a refinance or a purchase and there's a rental happening, we kind of get that data from the, from the tenant or from the homeowner and say, hey, what's this, uh, what's this two bedroom suite renting for? Thousand dollars. Okay. What does it include? Oh, it includes, uh, you know, utilities, but not the internet. We make all that, um, we keep all that information in house so we can apply that to future future appraisals so, so what we're hearing is a market rent is basically a full appraisal report essentially there's there's clearly a lot of data going into that a lot of work um you know how when you mentioned it was just one line and now it's this full report i would assume there's got to be a change in price now when somebody orders an appraisal it's obviously going to be a more expensive if they require that that market rent as well Absolutely. Yeah. About yeah, five to six years ago, it was a one liner and ad law appraisals. We did it for free for our clients because we do so much work with companies like Thrive and other brokerages that we would just do it as a value add for our clients. Um, and then once the appraisal institute said, oh, no, it has to meet all the requirements of a full appraisal means you have to have the comparables. You have to have an analysis. You have to know, you know, the zoning and all that stuff, for the property. Um, we do charge more for it. It's a little bit cheaper when it's included in a full appraisal. But if it's a standalone market rent, um, yeah, the fees are, uh, they range from about 100 to $200 for that. I think there's been a lot of value in learning about how these market rents work because a lot of our clients also rely on that for the purpose of qualification and and um, just generally speaking, knowing what they can rent a place for if they're using it as an investment from that perspective. You know, you mentioned Facebook Marketplace, you mentioned Craigslist. Have you seen the data that you receive or the places that you look for the data? Has that shifted a lot in the last couple of years? Um, so say that again, has the, has the data we were finding for market rents changed? Yeah. The, the places that you're looking for this information, have you seen that change? Like if I'm thinking about it from an investment perspective and I'm somebody who's looking to rent out a property or rent out a house or rent out my basement suite, like where are the locations that you're seeing most people start to actually advertise and have the most success in renting these units from your experience, at least. My experience is limited. A uh, property manager would be better suited to answer that. Um, however, Facebook Marketplace has just um, gained a lot of traction the last year or so, um, especially with focusing in on areas nice and easy. It's just a user-friendly system. And um, 
it helps appraisers because uh, I think Craigslist has like a GPS or um, postal code option, but it's still a little more clunky. And uh, yeah, Facebook's been coming a long way. Uh, in Okanagan, it's um, Castnet is a good one. I think the reason I brought that up is because again, a lot of people ask us straight away, like, hey, where do I look to rent this out? Or where should I look for market rents? Or where should I look to get an idea as to what this type of property would look like? And right away, there you go. So if you're looking in the lower mainland Vancouver area, like now it used to be Craigslist all the time. Now we're seeing Facebook Marketplace. If you're in Kelowna, it's not Craigslist or, or Marketplace might be, but you should be considering something called Castanet, right? So just kind of interesting from that perspective of where should people look and go. So you need to kind of know your local dem demographic or geographical area. Have you had uh, have you had any requests for a market rent for Airbnb? Is that a thing? There's no uh, user for that type of assignment. Um, it would just be for someone to get an idea of what they should rent it out for, for their own purposes. But you know, Airbnb has, if you, have a good property manager or they have some good algorithms that say, Hey, you should, you should put at this to get the maximum rent. Um, that's definitely outside our area of expertise. I mean, when the it, banks start accepting it, maybe yeah. we'll work on that. Let's hope so. Yeah. I, and I, we know what we appreciate you saying that right away. You kind of mentioned like if it's rental income, you should talk to a property manager, which is someone we will have on the podcast in the future to talk a little bit more about that. But hey, that's why we like guys like you who actually can tell us and let us know, hey, I'm not the guy. Go talk to these guys. So key and so important. So one last point, point on the rent. So when we're looking at an appraisal for the purpose of value, we're looking at like sales, say what's sold, right? But with rent, you're just looking at what's listed. So you could see that there's multiple listings for say $1,600 a month, but theoretically those could maybe be renting at a lower cost. Um, is there, do you see yeah. any changes coming in the future to maybe organize this a little bit better? Because it still seems really unorganized from a perspective of where you're getting your data. Are you, do you want to start a, a business with me, Dean? Sounds like a great business opportunity. <laughs> Let's go. You know, a, We're all in. We're all in. A, a database. It is. Uh, it's imperative that there's a that there's a database. So the multiple listing service has started um, a database with actual lease units. Um, so if it's uh, it's it's almost like a commercial uh, database. So in the commercial sector, if you're leasing a, a warehouse for twelve dollars a square foot and you get twelve dollars a square foot or eleven, it'll say that on MLS. And now MLS is doing that with residential, which is perfect. Um, with respect to like the Craigslist and the Facebook marketplace that have listings, we found generally speaking, the, the actual rents are very close to the listings. You can tell when someone's fishing and it's like just ridiculous. You know, we have a two bedroom apartment in Cloverdale. We're looking for $4,500 a month or something. You're like, okay, that's an outlier. We're not going to look at that, but you can get a pretty good idea. And we're not looking just at one. We're looking at five, six, seven, 10, 12 listings. Um, and then we can kind of corroborate that with our database and what we know about the market piece it all together and um and come up with something that's that's reasonable but it's a great point dean like i think there should be a database where people can uh you know pay and and get that data just like mls all right so man we got we got a we got a few more questions for you we want to end off we're going to talk a little bit about comparing your property to your neighbor's property we'll end that off there but i think we've got a few more questions we're going to do a little rapid fire through some of the questions that um, I feel like people just ask you all the time and they ask us all the time. So we got to give the people what they want. We got to give people what they need, which is the common questions or the common answers to those questions. Derek, why don't you lead us off here, man? Why don't you walk, walk through the first question? We'll try to do this a little bit more rapid fire to see if we can bang through this. So this question comes up all the time from the consumer, the client. Why can't I have a copy of my appraisal? Right on. So an appraisal is a financial document that's written for one reader only. Uh, for mortgage financing purposes, we create an appraisal report for uh, a lender. So whether it's Scotia Bank, First National, uh, TD Bank, they're the client and they're the only ones that are um, basically allowed to see, look at and use that report. It doesn't matter who pays for the report. Um, the borrower could pay for it. The broker could pay for it. Um, you know, any sort of situation is, is irrelevant. It's whoever the appraisal is written for. Uh, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of reason for that. So when you order an appraisal for Scotia Bank, for example, uh, we're writing it to Scotia Bank's guidelines, and we're writing it as uh, we're writing it to work towards a sophisticated reader. If that gets in the hands of the of the homeowner, it, it, it's a plethora of issues that can happen. Um, they could use it for a purpose that is not intended. So they can use it for separation, divorce, tax, uh, capital gains, estate planning, all these things. That gets really hairy. So they can get in a lot of trouble. Actually, the broker can get in a lot of trouble too if they're the ones that release that report, and so can Scotia Bank. Hmm. So it's important that when we are are writing these financial documents, that they get into the right hands, 
and stay in the right hands. And in this case, it's the the lenders, um, the lenders, the client, and they're the ones that has full full responsibility of that report. And that's so interesting because the number one question that, that we get asked to Derek's point is, "Hey, I paid for it. Why can't I have it?" So to your point, I believe what I'm hearing from you is that they are paying for the service to happen, which is required for the loan, but they're paying for it. The lender, however, is the one who owns the copy because it's required to release the loan funds. Is that correct? I think you, you touched on that perfectly. Ownership is the key word there. Who owns the report? It's the lender. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just thought about something. I pay school taxes and I don't have any kids to go to school. There so, you go. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a payment. It's, it's something that, that the borrowers have to pay to get the mortgage, right? They're not, they're not paying for an appraisal report, right? I don't, I don't think they're paying for an appraisal report. They're paying for to get that mortgage financing and that advice that you guys offer. So yeah. um, hopefully, you know, I'll keep hammering that as much as I can. And hopefully it's a, uh, that gets through. You mentioned there's multiple purposes, right? And you want it to be in the right hands for the purpose of that appraisal. Uh, now, for all these different reasons of why, we don't need to get into the all the why, but what reason would cause it to be more expensive? Because I would assume if a client's going to order that, you're writing in a different way, you're expecting different uh, feedback from that client than you would from a broker. So I would assume you're, there's a different price. Yeah. So uh, often what happens is, um, you know, the appraisal is done for, we're just going to keep advertising Scotiabank. An appraisal is done for Scotiabank. And then the borrower calls us and says, you know what, um, we're getting a separation and we need that appraisal for separation purposes. Um, the reason we can't provide that to them is because, um, one, it, it has to be written for that purpose in mind. It's got to be written so um, it can be um, used in a court of law. So if it's any sort of litigation or, or court or proceedings happening with in, in re, as a result of the separation, it has to be written with all that terminology, all that kind of complex wording. Um, we don't do that for the financing because the financing appraisal is a little bit more of a simple appraisal and we charge you know a um, lower rate accordingly. If they want to use it for separation or divorce purposes, the um, the price can be about double. Um, and if they want to use it for uh, tax purposes or estate planning purposes, we can uh, revise the appraisal a little bit and, and send it to them, but there is a fee for that. Yeah, it's called a letter letter of transmittal, and and we uh, as long as the um, the lender releases the report, um, we can do that. But it's really in the hands of the lender. And I'll be honest, like I've done hundreds and hundreds of these, lenders don't release reports. No, they don't. So so it's a, it's a challenging situation. My, my suggestion is um, you're paying for an appraisal for financing purposes. If you need an appraisal for something else, order a new appraisal um, and get that get that appraisal done well and for the specified purpose. All right. So, uh, Mr. Adam, we hire you for an appraisal. Uh, uh, one of your appraisers go to the property. They're in they're out in 10 minutes. Why does that happen and how can they do a good job in 10 minutes? Adam, explain this to me. A lot. So apartments, you know, a one bedroom apartment can take five minutes. Um, a townhouse can take 10, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes in a house, sometimes 20, 25 minutes, depending on the uh, size of the house. And the reason is, is that appraisers, I mean, our appraisers see over a hundred properties a month in a given area. So they know, they know the construction, they know the area, they know the different types of quality of homes. And, you know, once they get in that home, they can just, they can whip through it pretty quick. They have a very, um, uh, easy way to make notes of everything and you know once you've seen certain layouts once you've seen them a million times and um, so yeah they're, they're not checking the quality of the furnace the hot water tanks the drain tile the roof the integrity of, of those components so we're really just looking at room count you know the overall quality of the home any updates that sort of thing and then we do most of the work at home uh, we're a property inspector we'll spend four to five hours at the property you know, we spend 15, 20 minutes and then we go back to our office and type up the report, which can take a couple hours. So most of the work is done at home or at the home office. Love it. Yeah. Behind the scenes. Good answer. Good answer. We've got a couple more rapid fires here for you. So how long is appraisal good for? We get this question a lot. Yeah, that's up to the user of the report. So if I was a lender, um, you know, I would probably rely on it for two weeks, two to three weeks. And that's just because the market's changing so much. Um, and things can happen to a property, you know, uh, if, if it's an older home, uh, you know, a roof, uh, a tree could have fallen the roof, um, a dog could have uh, tore up the laminate flooring in one of the rooms, like all these things can happen. So you really want to use that appraisal as quickly as possible and, um, and not wait too long. I know some banks have a 60 day policy, but there's no, there's no concrete number. It's, uh, it's whatever the user is comfortable with. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So next do active listings 
impact appraised value? Can you use a property that's listed for sale, not sold? So no, the straight answer is is no. Um, but what a lot of people say is, you know, it's, it's listed for a million dollars, so mine must be worth around that. And um, the reality is, is that um, you can ask whatever you want for a property. It doesn't mean that's what it's going to sell for. So it's important that we look at, at actual closed sales that have completed. And um, and just in regards to that too, like even if a property sold for a million dollars next door and it was identical to your house doesn't mean that's what you're going to sell for because we have to look at the most probable resale price and that's just it's called cherry picking we can't just use one sale we have to use kind of look at the entire market and use our uh, use our judgment to put, put forward our value so let's say an appraisal is coming back it's not quite the value that someone wants or needs if there's a real estate agent involved in that transaction and maybe they have insights on a property that just removed subjects yesterday up the street, you wouldn't know that yet because it hasn't registered. What can somebody do to help you guys justify a higher value? What kind of information can be brought to the table? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So great question. So yeah, in the, in the mortgage financing space, um, you know, the higher the, the, the appraised values, the more flexibility you guys have in, in getting deals done. And we understand that. And, and sometimes appraisers can be on the conservative side, right? Because we are, our job really is to protect the bank's money. It's, it's not, um, not really to do any of the services for the brokers and the valuations are for the, the banks. And, you know, often appraisers are on the more conservative side. So if you do need a higher value, what I would suggest is, is get a realtor to provide three good comparables that they think um, would increase the value. Because one comparable usually won't do it. Um, and then if they give us 100 comparables, it just, it's too much data for us to, to process. Um, so yeah, get them to pick, get, get the realtor to pick, you know, about three comparables. They find most comparable to the subject and, and any sort of reasoning because um, often realtors know, know the market or know the property better than the appraiser because the appraiser, like I said, is just there for 10, 15 minutes. Um, and a, a, a realtor could have been there for hours and hours with the seller, hours and hours with the buyer, was there for the, the uh, property inspection and all that stuff. So if a realtor does feel that the value could be higher, just, get us those three comps and we can definitely uh, take it into consideration. Awesome, man. Yeah, we definitely hear that one all the time. Um, let's end her off on a, on a strong note. Uh, question of the day for us is always like people comparing, we're comparing our houses to our neighbor houses. My neighbor's house just sold for a million and it was appraised. Shouldn't my house be worth that as well? He kind of alluded to this earlier, but hey man, it comes up all the time when we're talking to people. It's like my neighbor just sold for X can I sell for this? Or my neighbor just, you know, prays for X. Doesn't that, you know, I'm saying, well, why is that the case? What happened? I think it's just important to, uh, to rely on an unbiased uh, perspective, which is, that's what we do. We're hundred percent unbiased. Uh, homeowners have lived in their home, raised their kids, you know, gotten married in the backyard, whatever it may be. And there's some attachment there, which is totally reasonable. Um, but from an appraiser standpoint, you know, we might look at things and say, you know what, your layout is actually not as good or, you're, 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 uh, you know, you have more of a pie shaped lot. This one's rectangular. It's, it's better for a, a, a builder. Um, so there's things that an appraiser can like a uh, perspective that an appraiser can bring that a homeowner just doesn't see, right. They just see kind of a, a basic home. It looks similar to their neighbors, but um, you know, it might not be the case. And, and updates are a big thing too. So someone might do a hundred thousand dollars in updates. Their neighbor did $250,000 of updates and used uh, a designer and just did a very bang up job and that's going to help the value of the neighbor as well there you go full circle from start to finish we talked about the east bend homes now we're talking about the different neighborhoods those those are probably the perfect example with which some of them are original and some of them like you mentioned have half a million dollars in them dude such good information today man can't wait to have you on again in the future and i look forward to the feedback that we get from our guests adam if we have someone on the show if it's a broker a real estate agent or a client that wants to reach out and they want to hire you as an appraiser my friend where should we send them you can go to adlawappraisals.com. That's where we have our, uh, you can order an appraisal, make payments, um, get in touch with us. We're also on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And we'll be happy to chat anytime. Uh, realtors are, are a great referral source for us because they're so well connected and their clients need appraisals for separation. They need appraisals for tax. They need appraisals for estate planning. And uh, we're ha happy to help. So you're saying that I should stop giving out your cell phone number? You've been giving out my cell number? <laughs> That's who's been calling, Bill. 
Oh, All right, buddy. Thanks for having us or uh, coming on the show. Well, thanks for having us. You just shared so much value with us. And I think people are going to walk away from this episode having like a literally a degree in appraisals. Uh, really appreciate all the value that you bring to us and our team and our consumers. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, my man. And uh, we can't wait to have you on again. See you soon. It's a pleasure. Thanks, guys.